Welcome once again to Noir Alley. I'm your host, Eddie Muller, waiting patiently all week at bar 355 so I can present to you another obscurity from the classic era of film noir. This month we have a selection of genuine classics, so today I felt I could get away with slipping something far less than classic into the mix. Violence, made at Monogram Pictures in 1947, won't earn many stars in any rated listing of movies. In fact, it might escape being listed at all. Monogram Pictures was part of what the big studios called, condescendingly, Poverty Row. It existed to churn out movies that filled the bottom half of double bills, which was the standard for movie exhibition in this era. Most of its offerings were typical genre fare, westerns, crime pictures, and adventure yarns, all made on shoestring budgets and ridiculously short schedules. But every once in a while, an ambitious producer or writer would stretch out into topical territory, making something ripped from today's headlines. No big deal, as long as their big ideas didn't bloat the budget or lengthen the running time. B-movies were often bought by exhibitors sight unseen, with little advanced publicity. They were typically part of packages built around splashier and more expensive A-list releases. On occasion, a modest crime picture like this might contain a message in a bottle, floated into the mainstream in the hope it would reach some receptive audiences. Some of these messages are what inspired the House Un-American Activities Committee to launch investigations into purported communist influence in Hollywood. But were these suspected subversives actually under the sway of the Soviet Union? Or were they opposed to politicians trying to eliminate opposition to their own ideological agenda? Or were they just exploiting current events to tell timely and provocative stories? I can say with complete certainty that the creators of this film, writer Stanley Rubin and director Jack Bernhardt, were not enemies of the state. Rubin was an ambitious writer who wanted to produce, and here he was re-teaming with Bernhardt in the wake of their ultra-weird 1946 film Decoy, which dropped plenty of jaws when I showed it a while ago on Noir Alley. They're up to something else here dealing with a topic no major studio would touch in 1947. RKO's Crossfire came close, but its exploration of hate crimes focused on an isolated villain. This film offers a more bitter view of organized hate, specifically how opportunistic politicians foment hatred to seize power and influence. As stiff and corny as this movie often is, it's exceptional in its prescient depiction of a situation that 75 years later is an even more insidious infection in the nation's bloodstream. Also unique is that violence is one of the few crime programmers of the era to feature a female protagonist. Well, at least she starts out as the protagonist. Nancy Coleman plays a scrappy and resourceful journalist who goes undercover to expose the truth behind True Dawson, a corrupt America First candidate building a political base on the festering anger of disenfranchised veterans. Later films like All the King's Men and A Face in the Crowd would tackle with much more money, talent, and craft the theme of how demagogues are made. But I give a lot of credit to the makers of violence for being there first and not couching anything in vague allusions. The dialogue in this film is as blunt and straightforward as the filmmaking. You cannot miss the point. But as a storyteller, Stanley Rubin wasn't really interested in message mongering. He liked a hot topic, but mostly he loved throwing unexpected wrinkles into his plots. And there are a few unexpected twists and turns in this one, including the injection of a plot device that pops up in film noir as often as a common cold. This is not a great film, to say the least, but it is a fascinating historical curio that still has resonance. Co-starring Michael O'Shea, Sheldon Leonard, and Emery Parnell as True Dawson, here is Violence. Well, 
At least it's short. Sorry if that didn't live up to the intro, but I thought at least from a historical perspective, this film is too interesting to pass over. Lots of post-war noir used trauma suffered by GIs as plot devices, especially the battle-induced amnesia you see in films like High Wall, Somewhere in the Night, The Clay Pigeon, and The Crooked Way. Violence is unique because it tapped into a real economic crisis that faced the country in the years immediately following the war. Inflation was spiraling out of control, and many American corporations wanted to return to pre-war pay levels, while the public wanted to celebrate victory with a new level of prosperity. Businesses slashed wages and strikes were rampant across the nation. The government wouldn't allow the armed forces or National Guard to be used against U.S. citizens who had just defended America from fascist enemies. So many businesses turned to four hire goon squads as strike breakers, and the leaders of these gangs exploited their power for political gain. This was happening all over the country at the time violence was released. So while the film is tepid compared to an amazingly eccentric piece of work like Decoy, it is a topical time capsule of that national moment. Michael O'Shea didn't make too many noir films. He was just too avuncular on screen, playing sort of a live-action leprechaun in lots of comedies and musicals. His big break came opposite Barbara Stanwyck in 1943's Lady of Burlesque. And in 1947, he married Virginia Mayo, a union that lasted until O'Shea's death in 1973. An unpretentious sort, O'Shea always maintained his membership in the Bricklayers Union, the job he had before becoming an actor. Nancy Coleman didn't get many great roles in movies, but she enjoyed a diverse career, moving easily between radio, television, and stage, all the way into the 1980s. Co-star Emery Parnell, who played True Dawson, had one of those life stories that stagger a contemporary imagination. In his youth, he was both a concert violinist and prospected for gold in the Arctic. Even after becoming a sought-after bit player in films, he was part of the Preston Sturgis Stock Company, Parnell would still tour the world with his wife and son, performing a musical act in which he played several instruments simultaneously. Sheldon Leonard was working as an investment counselor on Wall Street, when the stock market crash of 1929 spurred his switch to acting. He moved from Broadway to Hollywood in 1939, where he spent more than a decade playing featured roles in all sorts of movies. In Open Secret, another B message picture made the same year as violence, Leonard played a small town cop investigating an anti-Semitic hate group, showing his tough guy persona worked on both sides of the law. Leonard shifted gears in the 1950s, becoming one of the most successful TV producers in the business, creating, among others, The Danny Thomas Show, The Dick Van Dyke Show, and The Andy Griffith Show. I Spy, which he produced in 1965, broke the television color line by giving a black man, Bill Cosby, a co-starring role. Next week, we'll have something very special on Noir Alley. We're celebrating TCM's 30th anniversary with an all-day tribute to the great Robert Osborne. And though he sadly won't be here with me, we will be together co-hosting a film we both cherish. Be here when Bob and I present The Breaking Point, a 1950 classic starring John Garfield and Patricia Neal. None of us, my hosting colleagues or our loyal audience, would be watching TCM today were it not for the influence and devotion of Robert Osborne. So I know I'll see you back here next week to pay him proper tribute. Until then, see you in the shadows. Next on TCM, summer of 42, then class of 44, and later, rooftops of Manhattan. It's a hell of a town on TCM Tonight.